thank you for all your many lessons, Lord Baelish. I will never forget them. Hello and welcome to my review of the final episode of Game of Thrones Season 7. We only had 7 episodes this year, but what a cracking 7 they were. I think something crazy happened in just about every single episode. I've been reviewing this entire season. You can go back and watch my videos if you want to see them. Those of you who have watched them may have noticed my hand of the kingpin is missing because it broke unfortunately. But don't worry, I've told my maester to fetch me another. So uh, hopefully by next season, I'll have my hand back. Strap in, here we go. One last look at the last episode of Game of Thrones season seven. The episode begins with Bronn and Jaime stood atop the battlements of King's Landing, looking down at Daenerys's army of Unsullied and Dothraki. Now, to me, I, I feel like it wasn't stressed quite enough that part of Cersei's agreement to let Danny and Jon come and meet with her also meant that she would allow the Unsullied to leave Castle Rock, where Euron essentially had them trapped. Uh, I, I feel like some people kind of thought that there was about to be a battle at that beginning bit there, and that it was glossed over. That wasn't the case. Daenerys basically had the Unsullied and the Dothraki present themselves as a show of force to show, you know, she's a force to be reckoned with and not to fuck with her. Bronn and Jamie look down at this army and, you know, once again, regardless of, of the having dragons on her side, see that Daenerys, you know, has still got plenty of men to back her up as well. And they have a conversation which kind of starts off funny, just, uh, uh, Jamie says maybe the war in general just comes down all to cocks. And uh, at the same time, as, as kind of funny as this exchange was between him and Bronn, it, it's kind of true, the, the philosophy of war. It's all about lines of succession and, you know, proving who's, you know, the boss, the one in charge. I mean, yeah, in a way, regardless of the politics and stuff like that, when you put that all aside, maybe it does just all come down to Cox. We then cut down to Tyrion and... Varys and Missande and Jorah and John on a ship sailing towards King's Landing to arrive and Tyrion tells John that over a million people inhabit King's Landing. Now I feel like this was kind of a callback to the fact that obviously not only if the army are dead attacks that will be one million extra soldiers for them but also kind of a call back to the fact that when Jaime killed Daenerys's father the Mad King Ares Targaryen he saved over a million people from being blown to hell um so I feel like that was just a slight reminder of you know the thing he did like for all his sins he has done something incredibly heroic and you know it was mentioned a couple of times this season that King's Landing is capable of housing a million people and I kind of wonder if that might come into play later um is King's Landing going to get destroyed and we'll know that a million people have died or I've heard some people theorize that they might evacuate King's Landing draw in the White Walkers and their army into King's Landing and then blow them up a bit like with the Sept and you know we'll know that over a million White Walkers were killed, you know, the entire army could be killed in one fell swoop. Who knows, but that was a callback, I think, to Jamie, and it might be worth keeping in mind the population of King's Landing for Season 8. Our heroes all then have a massive meet-up on their way to the Dragon's Pit in King's Landing. We get to see Tyrion, Bronn and Podrick reunite the heroes of the Blackwater. It was really great to see them all again. Obviously, you know, they, they've all kind of been around each other in the seasons leading up to this. Podrick was Tyrion's squire, you know, him and Bronn used to have top bants. They all fought at the Battle of the Blackwater, that's where Bronn got his uh, knighthood. That's where Podrick saved Tyrion from the member of the King's Guard that tried to kill him. You know, they've all got so much history and it was great to see them all reunited again, if only for a brief moment. 
the Hound and Brienne also met one another again after she damn near killed him. Um, and I really like the way they handled that, you know, neither Brienne nor the Hound were, you know, pussyfooting around it. He was just like, alright, you know. And then they, he asked after Arya, almost like she was their child in a way. And Brienne was like, don't worry, I got her somewhere safe. And it doesn't even matter anyway, because she can handle herself now. And you can see the Hound, you know, kind of proud about that. They take their place in the dragon's pit and then Cersei arrives with her entourage. The Hound sees his undead brother, Gregor Clegane, and he walks up to him and he's just like, damn man, you're ugly now. Like, what have they done to you? You know, obviously he was still alive last time he saw them. And, you know, he says to him, I'm coming for you. Like, you've always known I'm coming for you. And I still am, okay? And I, I think that very much kind of uh, was reigniting the hype for Click Game Bowl, get hype. Um, you know, we've wanted to see the Hound and Gregor go at it since season one. They both want to kill each other. And I hope we get to see that. I mean, with only one season left and only six episodes, one would think there may not be time for that, but maybe they will get to finally cross swords, you know? And... Uh, it will be bloody if they do. Who who can say who win? Hopefully Sander, but they might well just kill each other. Daenerys then arrives on Drogon, and you know even Cersei, she was trying to keep a game face, but seeing a dragon in the flesh, you know, even she was like, whoa. I mean, she's one of the few make out at this point who hasn't seen a dragon. Jaime had obviously seen one before during his battle. You know, all of Tyrion, um, Daenerys side, like Tyrion and Jorah, have seen a dragon. So Cersei, it was her first time, she seemed suitably impressed, although she kept it as cool as possible. But I mean, what an entrance for Danny to come in on. I mean, if you're coming to negotiate with your enemies, coming in on a dragon is a pretty strong way to start. The, the Hound then releases the undead from the box that he was carrying on his back, and it comes rushing towards Cersei, but luckily he pulls on the chain and takes it away from her just before it kills her and Cersei is visibly upset by this and is like holy shit we we see Euron apparently abandoning Cersei just being like fuck this I'm out um, you know he's like can they swim no well I'll go back to my island uh, so yeah and Cersei seems at first to agree to some kind of truce but her uh, one of her orders is that John must remain neutral during her war with Daenerys. He can't join forces with Daenerys. And John says, look, I'm just going to be honest. I, I'm following Daenerys. If she goes to war with you, I'm going to go to war with you. And Cersei's like, well, fuck this then. And uh, <laughs> fuck this for a game of soldiers. I'm going home. And it seems like all is lost. But then Tyrion says he'll go and talk to his sister. The next scene was Tyrion speaking with Cersei. I felt like this was a really powerful scene. You had Tyrion meet Jaime outside her door and he was like, are we both idiots or what? Like, what's going on? I feel like Jaime at this point was already beginning to really understand Cersei is a lost cause. Tyrion finally goes in to Cersei's room and they have a really heated exchange about, you know, she blamed him for the deaths of... Marcella and Tommen, which is pretty fucking rich considering Tommen killed himself because Marjorie died and she was killed by Cersei. So I don't see how that's Tyrion's fault. But, you know, you could argue the death of Tywin left the Lannisters very vulnerable. So she has a lot of anger towards him. He he swears, you know, he loved her children. He didn't want any harm to come to them. I, I thought this was incredible acting by Peter Dinklage and Lena Headey. You know, I think they're two of the best actors in the show and I think this was one of their their best scenes together I mean I felt like the emotion was just so raw eventually Tyrion figures out that Cersei is pregnant uh they seem to kind of indicate this with her putting her hand over her stomach protectively however I, I also have a little theory that he also figured it out because she wasn't drinking Cersei loves a glass of wine he offers her one puts it on the table in front of her and after some time she still hasn't touched it and I think that along with her hand he's like are you pregnant? <laughs> I mean, that's the only way you can't be drinking. And it seems like Tyrion manages to get Cersei seemingly to agree to the truce. However, we don't know what he offered her in exchange. The scene cuts before we hear his side. So Cersei seems to be on board. But what is it Tyrion said to her or promised her in exchange? We don't find that out. And uh, I think that could be something very important in season eight. 
We then travel to Dragonstone where Daenerys agrees to travel up north rather than a dragon but by ship with Jon, probably because of the implication. Um, and then we had a really good scene with Jon and Theon. You know, Theon has... He's such a car crash at this point. He's done so many bad things and had so many bad things done to him and everyone pretty much despises him. And... You know, he has this conversation with John where he's just like, how is it you always seem to make it seem so easy to do the right thing? And John's like, look, I've done some shit as well, okay? Uh, it hasn't been easy, although I haven't done things quite as bad as you. And, you know, I thought this was this showed a really good side both to Theon and John. So many characters just refuse to, to give any sympathy to Theon, and understandably so. However, you know, John, he's just pretty cool and he's just like look I can't forgive you for everything but for what I can forgive you for I do and he he just cuts the on some slack he seems to recognize he wants to be a good man again and then he gives him some great advice where he says you know just because you have great joy in you but you were raised by Starks doesn't mean you have to choose to be one or the other you can be both which is very much like John thinks he is being a bastard and a Stark, he's able to accept both. And I wonder if he's going to have to follow this advice when he finds out he's really a Targaryen, but obviously is also quite Stark in that he was raised by Ned Stark and his mother was a Stark. Uh, so I feel like this was some foreshadowing. Theon decides he's going to rescue his sister Yara from Euron and he goes to the few ironborn men he has left and tries to take charge of them. But kind of understandably, they're like, you're no leader, man. Like, why should we follow you on a suicide mission? But he proves his mettle by he gets his ass beat but refuses to stay down and eventually overcomes the, the captain of the the people left and you know he says for Yara and it seems to me like this could well be a suicide mission I I feel like perhaps Theon could die saving his sister I, I think he will succeed in maybe killing Euron or at least freeing Yara but obviously I think this is going to be a difficult task but he has got 20 good men now and as we know in Game of Thrones that could really move mountains. Over at Winterfell Sansa has Arya taken into custody and seemingly has her brought on trial for suspicions of, you know, trying to tear House Stark apart and perhaps plotting to kill Sansa. Now, I was really worried about this, as I said in my last few videos. I was worried this was poor writing and that they really were going to have Arya and Sansa have some drama between them, uh, despite everything they've been through. And I, I was concerned about this. I, I felt it just had made no sense. And there was a theory circulating that this might all be a ploy to get Littlefinger. But I, I was worried it wasn't. However, it turns out I was wrong. It was a ploy the whole time. Littlefinger has finally got his. I've hated that slimy bastard since season one. And now he's finally dead. Okay. Huge props to uh, the actor that plays him. I think he's done a fantastic job making him so slimy and hateable. Um, you know, he, you just, you hate to even hate him. It's not like Joffrey where you kind of like to hate him. Like, I hated him. He was so creepy. I mean, at least bad guys who, you know, put a sword in their hand and do their murdering themselves. At least they do it themselves. Whereas little figure just corrupted everyone around him and he started this whole goddamn war between the Lannisters and the Starks he's caused so much damage and it was so good to finally see him get him get his you know you had you had Sansa going how do you plead little finger and the the way his little smug smirk dropped from his face at first he kind of keeps his head and tries to defend himself sensibly but then Brad is just like boop, 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 I know everything and he's just like shit and and obviously no one up north likes him and you know I wonder if maybe he could have demanded trial by combat that that would have been quite fitting I guess and no one would obviously want to stand for him but obviously we haven't got much time left in this series he's He's dead, and Arya just comes up, slits his throat. I, I kind of felt like perhaps Sansa should have been the one to do it, not only because Ned Stark lived by the mantra of the man who passes the sentence should swing the sword, but also because, you know, Sansa is arguably the one who suffered most at the hands of Littlefinger, and I feel like, you know, she hasn't kind of personally killed anyone herself with her own hands, and it would have been nice to see her deliver the last blow. But, you know, Arya did it, and fine. I mean, she knows how to use a sword better than Sansa, so fair enough. Less to clean up. 
but it was so good to see that the Stark girls are finally on the same page. This war's just a ploy and that really they've got each other's back. Um, huge props to Aidan Gillen, the actor of Littlefinger. He did an incredible job of portraying him over the past seven seasons. But god damn, is it good to see Littlefinger finally get his. Back at King's Landing, we see Jamie preparing his men to head up north to help Daenerys and Jon fight the White Walker invasion. And Cersei has his men sent away and just goes, Are you an idiot? As if I'm going to have an alliance with them. As if I'm going to have a truth. Truth. And poor Jamie, his face just drops, you know, he he really had a purpose there, he was doing something honourable, he couldn't wait to get up there, and he's just like, what? Like, you saw the undead the same as me, like, this is real, this is not just politics. Something terrible is coming, and we need to band together if we're going to survive this. And she's just like, no, let, let if, you know, the North win, they'll be damaged from their fight and we'll crush them. If the White Walkers win, they'll be damaged from fighting the Northmen and then we'll crush them. And Jamie's like, bitch, are you crazy? Like, you know, and uh, he's just like, look, I've seen this threat. I don't care what you say. I'm going up north. And she's just like, you're going to walk away from me. And she says she'll have Sir Gregor kill him. And I was nervous for Jamie at this point. He's one of my favourite characters. I was concerned she was going to kill him then and, you know, really prove herself to be insane. But he calls her bluff and says, I don't believe you, and walks away from her and leaves this woman who has manipulated him pretty much all his life. And that was a great moment. I love the way you see Jamie riding out from King's Landing. He covers his right hand with a black glove. And, you know, he's got a dark horse now. Obviously, his last one was killed by Drogon. Uh, we didn't see Bronn with him. I hope he got Bronn to tag along with him. You know, I hope Bronn and Jamie are heading out there together. You'd think he would, but maybe not. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought this was such a, a tense scene, just how mad Cersei is getting at this point. And I kind of wonder, I theorise that maybe the only reason that Cersei didn't kill Jaime then was because the only person she'd be able to blame for it was herself. You know, she blames the deaths of everyone she loves on other people when most of them are a result of her careless actions. But with Jamie, he was just like, if you want me dead, you do it. And, you know, she doesn't have the stones for it in the end. So I'm so glad to see Jamie, who's been trying to be a better person, get away from, you know, Cersei. She's such a bad impression on him. And hopefully he's going to join Danny and John up north and they'll be all heroes together. In Winterfell, Sam meets Bran again after having helped him get back to the wall in a previous season and Bran reveals to him that Jon is seemingly a bastard of Rhaegar and Lyanna but then Sam is like shit no when I was up in uh, the Citadel with Gilly she revealed that Rhaegar's Majesty Elia was annulled and that uh, he really did marry Lyanna so Jon is a Jon Sand he's Jon Targaryen and then we see Bran go to that period where they got married and then sees Lyanna whisper to Ned that John's name is really Aegon Targaryen. Da -da -da -da, like, whoa. And, you know, I think this uh, was a great scene, obviously, because we find out the real truth behind John's parentage. But we also discovered that Bran, although he can kind of see everything and knows everything, you know, he has access to kind of like the internet where he could just look up anything he wants. You know, despite having all of this, he is kind of blind in some ways. Like, he has so much information. If he doesn't know specifically what he's looking for, he, he doesn't necessarily just know everything. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like when you go to Google, you have the world, you know, at your feet. But you're still kind of directionless. You, you know, you need someone to be like, right, Google this or go there. You know, you, you don't just instantly absorb everything. And I feel like uh, that was a good way to show that although Bran is very powerful, he, he isn't kind of omnipotent. So I, I thought that was very good. Um, I love the fact that Rhaegar in the marriage scene looks so much like Viserys Targaryen from season one. And that really makes sense that Viserys, if he thought he was the last dragon, as he says, you know, and he idolised his older brother. It really makes sense that he would style himself to look as much like Rhaegar as possible. So I thought that was a really good choice by, uh, you know, the costume directors and the people who did the hair and such. So, yeah, massive bomb drop there. And, you know, John is really the the heir to the Iron Throne. He is he, he outranks Daenerys in, on that front. And that also means, of course, that Daenerys is his aunt and he is her nephew. So, of course, <laughs> in the next scene, we see them banging. 
So after a lot of sexual tension, John and Daddy finally do the deed and outside their door Tyrion looks on kind of seemingly concerned um, and people have been speculating a lot about this. Is he just worried that John and Danny's relationship will cause friction in the war to come? Does he know something? Perhaps he suspects their true lineage? I, I don't see how that could be but maybe or perhaps he's worried about the thing that he promised Cersei in return for her allowing a truce while they go up north. I don't know, but Tyrion seemed perplexed at that point and it seems like he sat on something big. So we'll have to wait for season eight to see what that is. But I feel like something was going on there. I've heard some people say that they feel like John and Danny's relationship seems a bit forced, that there wasn't much chemistry between them and that the only reason they're getting together is kind of for fan service. But personally, I have to disagree with this. I'm all for criticising the writing when it deserves it. But I feel like this kind of makes sense because consider that John and Danny both lost their true loves. She lost Cal Drogo and to a lesser extent, um, Dario Naharis, and John lost his grit. And, you know, at this point in Game of Thrones, they're both so jaded and cynical and they've both seen so much death and lost so much that I feel like it would be really weird if they were acting like teenagers around each other or like, it, you know, really flirty or something. They, the stakes are too high to be worried about their romance at this point. And so they, they seem to understand and have respect for each other and they like each other, but they're not, you know, going to be like tittering behind one another's backs and, you know, playing games at this point. So I feel like it was fitting that when they got a moment together, you know, where they didn't have to be doing something big like planning an invasion, they were just like, what's up, come in my room, you know, and um, yeah, so I, I feel like that just kind of makes sense, and also they, they've seen so much death recently, that sex is quite a life-affirming act, you know what I mean, I, I think it kind of makes sense that two people who are attracted to each other anyway, who have been through so much, would just be like, should we just bag and have a good time for five minutes before the shit gets piled on us again, you know? So, personally, I think it totally makes sense that they're getting together. Obviously a bit weird that there aren't a nephew, but given that this show starts with Twincest, I, I don't think we can really complain, can we? And then the final scene shows Tormund and Beric Dondarrion at Eastwatch on the Wall, where they see the army of the undead finally reach Eastwatch. They're like, oh shit, we've been waiting for this, here they come. But unbeknownst to them, the Night's King has his Ice Dragon now and he comes right again and he begins to destroy the wall by having the Ice Dragon just blow this like ice fire at the wall. Which is kind of weird, you'd think to break the wall, which is made of ice, you'd use fire. But you'd think that ice would just make it stronger. But still, you know, it's magic ice. And he, he crumbles a section of the wall which allows his army to get through and it's like shit the wall is down the wall is down the undead are marching on westeros with nothing to keep them out now we see loads of uh, the night's watchmen at east watch fall to their death and Tormund and beric are mia at this point we don't know if they're alive or dead i would assume that if they were properly dead we'd have seen it because that would have been a more effective way to close the episode uh, I wouldn't be surprised if at least one of them is still alive, you know, like it cuts in the first episode of season 8, we saw Tormund burst out the snow, you know, I hope so, I love them both as characters, so I hope they did manage to survive, but who knows at this point, but then we just finish the episode with the army of the undead just pouring into Westeros, and shit's hit the fan, and we are ready for season 8. Personally, I feel like this was another really strong episode and generally speaking, I think it's been a very strong series overall. My only real gripe with it is how quickly characters are just being able to teleport around Westeros. In earlier seasons, it was established that, you know, it takes a long time to get places. Think how long it took for Ned and King Robert to get from King's, uh, from Winterfell down to King's Landing, you know? So I, I'm not a huge fan of that. It kind of feels like it just makes it too easy for things to happen quickly. It feels like there's not a lot of build up. However, given that it's a shorter season next season and a short this was a short season, I kind of get why they're doing it. But at the same time, I feel like it's their own fault for deciding to have short seasons. So I don't really like that. However, in terms of acting, in terms of you know the spectacle, it's been superb. And it's still a fantastic show, even if it's not quite as tight as it used to be. But, you know, with so many plot lines converging, 
it kind of makes sense that it would have to, you know, play a bit fast and loose. Obviously, it won't be as tight as the books. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's been really strong. I can't wait for season eight, which could be two goddamn years away. Like, now I watch begins, huh? Still, not as long as waiting for the books. All right, George? Uh, but, you know, yeah, I think it's been really good. I think I feel like every main actor in it has had a sequence where they've really shown what a great act they are you know big props to Lena Headey, Peter Dinklage, Nikolai Costa-Waldo, Kit Harrington, Amelia Clark you know they, they've all been doing a, a great job and yeah I'm sure as well as the rest of you I'm really looking forward to season eight feel free to let me know your comments did you like it did you not like it what have you made of the season so far what do you think about this uh you know the fact that characters seem to have teleportation now let me know in the comments below and I'll be doing more videos, obviously not necessarily about Game of Thrones for a while now, but I will cover Season 8 when it comes out, so feel free to subscribe if you want. I'll see you guys next time. Fala Magoulis.